Welcome to Blue Compass, where we are here today to share a webinar talking about eight ways you can easily integrate AI into your marketing today. So many of our clients and marketers we speak to are asking how they can utilize AI to enhance their marketing efforts. We have tested a lot, seen both good and bad integrations of AI. So today we are talking about eight actionable takeaways that you can integrate into the day-to-day -day tasks that you as a marketer are completing. With me here today, we have Jay, our senior digital marketing strategist. Jay's really heavily integrated into our Google ads, into our in-platform paid marketing efforts, and has a lot of tips and tricks for us today. This is Danny. She is a digital marketing strategist with us. And Danny really works heavily in strategies, content marketing, SEO, and a lot of our other digital marketing efforts. So we're gonna take you through this today. As we get started, we really wanted to talk about what we've seen so far and what's making AI such a prevalent conversation in the marketing world today, especially from an SEO perspective. So previously, early last year, as AI was really becoming as popular, really becoming mainstream, we saw a lot of websites trying to take the, the cheat code method and using AI to write all of their content. They uploaded it to their websites and they really saw a boost, if we're being honest, in their SEO. They saw more traffic, increased keywords, all of these things. And then all of a sudden they tanked. With the March 2024 spam update that was released, tons of websites who had been heavily relying on AI for their content totally got racked in that update. So it really made it hit home that we as marketers need to be diligent. We need to use AI to help our marketing efforts, but we cannot replace our people. We cannot replace our strategies and we can't replace quality good work with them. In this spam update, reading a quote to you from Google, the update did not penalize the use of AI content creation, but it does expect AI generated content to mean the meet the same standards as content created by human authors. We know that's a feat that AI just can't achieve. So it's very important for us to integrate really quality editing and quality people into that. Jay and Danny, how have you seen that work for our clients and for us here at Blue Compass? I think a lot of times when you're writing content, kind of as you were saying, using it to enhance something that you've already written versus giving it a prompt to have the AI or ChatGPT write from scratch. Well, that can be helpful to your point everybody that does that is going to get out most likely the same response and that's how you're going to get hit by a spam um, notification so using it as a prompt or putting in your own content to have it enhance what you've already written is a better way to utilize it versus asking it to write a page or a blog from scratch for you yeah you're missing all of the differentiation that you get as an individual taking a stance ai is going to take like the most generic stance on all of these things and just play right down the middle of the road whereas often you have a way that you think about this subject or you have an opinion on it and so injecting that into it and then to danny's point enhancing it whether that's by tone or by grammar or making it more concise like all of those are great ways to leverage ai while still maintaining the value of the human aspect, which is the opinion and taking like a strong stance on your area of expertise. One of the key things that I've seen people forget is AI can only grab from something that exists in its database. So like you said, Danny, if two people enter the same prompt, they're gonna get similar results if they haven't fed it custom information. So it's really important, think about what makes your product or service different. Think about what makes your people better. What is your culture like? What are those components that make your company more competitive and better than your competitors? And you need to be able to infuse that either into the AI to help it spit out something better or make sure that's what you're heavily editing for and really bringing that value of who you are into that content. Mm -hmm. For sure. I think another key thing to think about with in regards to that is AI is optimizing for what it's seen strongest performance or like strongest thumbs up for, which means a bunch of people are all getting that same type of response. I know we're kind of retreading similar path here, um, but again, that's where that differentiation comes in because- if, But inherently wouldn't be unique. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's jump into our first question. Jay, we're gonna start with you. We have some tried and true automation opportunities that we utilize here at Blue Compass. How are we leveraging and recommending AI to be integrated into email content specifically? Yeah, email is a great place to start with AI because there's a lot of natural pathways into it. The first one that normally comes to mind is with content, uh, which is a great place to start because it, that can be the 
where the most legwork is done with email. Um, but you do have to be careful as it relates to it. We just had this whole conversation about originality and having it be duplicate. Um, but also with AI, you only get back as good as what you put into it. So having a really good prompt or query to go into there is is really important. So spending a lot of time, think about who your audience is, what your tone is, what your brand is, and how does that need to be uh, conveyed to the AI platform. The second thing that I would think about as it relates to email as more of a 201 or more advanced way to leverage it is using the data that you get back from your email platforms. So whether that's using your customer lists with some additional enhanced data or actual data from your email performance to then optimize your campaigns based on whatever it is you're optimizing for. Um, and almost all of these platforms have that ability to export your data. So whether you're using MailChimp or SendGrid or whatever it is, um, that is a really helpful way to get new ideas about what am I not seeing that maybe AI would be able to see out of this? What trends can I take away and expand on? And some example prompts for that with the exported data that you've uploaded into whatever you're utilizing for your AI platform are what do my top performing email recipients have in common? Yeah. You can get information about is that there a specific job title? Is there, you know, it's all based on the information that you have available to you. But that can really tell you who's interacting most. And you can leverage that in the email platform and pull that into your other paid marketing. OK, we know we've got a really hot email that worked really well with marketing directors. OK, let's focus that campaign. Let's put some paid social behind it to extend that message and continue to get some uptick from that. Mm -hmm. I think, too, if you have their location in your database, like what region of people was most interested in the topic that you had emailed them about. I think that's also a really um, useful way that you can utilize an AI platform to help you determine like what region was most interested in what I emailed about. And then also, Jay, you touched on it in email platforms. Most of the time, they'll say most people open this email at 10 a.m. on Wednesday. And so then the next time you send an email and again, you don't even have to export your data for that per se. You can just use the platform to then determine, OK, well, next time I'm going to send on Wednesday at 10 a.m. because that was the most popular time people opened my email. Absolutely. We, this kind of bridges the gap between both of them and that data export. But something AI is really good at is brainstorming and getting started with a concept as well. So taking that email data about what's performing well, sending that or submitting that into your query and saying, what content haven't I covered that would be valuable to this audience? Or what is a, if you have click data, what is something that they're really interested in, but we barely touched on that we could really leverage more of and brainstorm 10 ideas about what else could we cover in a newsletter. Slides. Absolutely. And when you're trying to be more advanced, I also love when we write one or two killer subject lines and then we have AI generate some additional variations off of that. Again, we're uploading our content in. So we're that original thought leader, but then it's giving us some variations that we might not think of for our subject lines first thing, really quality A-B testing, especially if you have a big list. Mm -hmm. All righty, moving into our second question. Danny, how are we utilizing AI for ad copy and more A-B testing? Yeah, so at Blue Compass, we definitely recommend A-B testing your social advertising just because it allows you to get more information about your customers. What are they interacting with? What type of conversations or information are they most likely to click on? And so, AI and ChatGPT can be a really good tool for testing out other headlines and descriptions in your ads. So we recommend coming up with something really strong that you feel good about and then determining, OK, like what's another version of this that I could test in order to figure out what people are are interacting with most. So again, come up with something really strong on your own that you feel really good about and then come up with a second version. I think it'll be really interesting to see, okay, are people reacting to what I wrote or more like what Chappie chat gpt wrote and again and make sure you're reviewing that and enhancing it so that it still sounds like you it sounds like your brand and your company um but again it's just like another way to be more creative because sometimes you run into roadblocks when you're writing content and we understand that and so that's a really great way to utilize that tool to come up with other headlines and descriptions for your ads absolutely and the volume of content you need to upload per all of these platform standards right now is kind of ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, meta at 1.1 and seven different ad variations. And I know you can do mirror images and you can just swap your headlines with your other descriptions. But like 
that's a lot of content that you have to be responsible for for a single campaign. And then if you need ad rotation on top of that, mm -hmm. you're just doubling and tripling that. Right. So it is it is a heavy lift for marketers today to run quality campaigns to get the optimization scores that they need in these platforms. Even thinking about Google ads, you need what? 15 headlines and how many just des four descriptions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I'd say the other thing on top of that is there's so many things that you need to be thinking about that AI, even if you give it the guardrails, it doesn't always follow the rules you put mm -hmm. out there. So you have a character count limit on your headlines and descriptions. You can say, don't have this be longer than 30 characters and include a keyword, and it may not follow either of those. So if you're if you're using AI to build out all of your headlines and descriptions, 15 of them, and you don't spot check those types of things, mm -hmm. you can run into a lot of issues. And then you're all the way up to implementing this campaign and you're getting red flags everywhere because now you need to rework everything because it's not following the rules of the platform. So there's so much you have to think about. So again, it comes down to really good prompts, but also almost never going to be used, be able to use exactly what you get. Jay, we're coming to you for question number three. Can you give us any thoughts around how to use AI to streamline editing, proofing, and checking for tone of voice? Yeah, so I think this builds on what we've talked about a lot already, but AI really is a support tool or an enhancement to what you already have. So whether it's long form content, short form content, head headlines, descriptions, whatever it is, um, it's really helpful to use AI by submitting that content in and saying, can you make this more concise? Or we're really looking for a professional, but lighthearted tone to this message. Can you sweep through and correct anything that you would correct here? And it's really good at that type of stuff. So for a person like me, uh, when writing long emails, I'm not a concise person. Katrina's smiling because she sees this all the time. <laughs> I skip words all the time. And so yeah. those are the types of things that get picked up in AI. Obviously there are tools like Grammarly and whatnot that leverage this, but, but to get that final seal of approval and final review on something like that, um, where you have weaknesses inherently, it's perfect for those types of things. Um, so I, I, I would really recommend it in those situations when you're looking for like just a small tonal tweak or like this needs to be shorter than what it is right now. One of the better implementations of that that I've seen recently is we have a couple of clients who are using closed AI systems that we have access to. So it's not through ChatGPT. It's not available to the public. This helps with compliance, sometimes makes the team a little bit more comfortable with it. But then having threads or conversations in there that you're able to upload your brand guide, upload your internal manuals. If you have internal training guides, SOPs, any of that, being able to upload that into a proper thread that's contained in that topic and then passing your content through it. OK, check this against the brand guide and then it'll show you where it doesn't match. It'll show you where you may be inconsistent with word choice, anything like that, or if you're a little too stuffy and you have a more relaxed feel on that platform. And that's a really cool way to be able to leverage the assets you have, comb through all of that data in a really quick manner to get some of those answers. It can also help with training and onboarding team members. And I know that's not what we're here to talk about today, but as marketers, we all need help. And if you have your SOPs in a single place and then that new team member has a question, they're able to get the answer from you, from what you guys believe, without having to go ask somebody or interrupting conversations, meetings, and other ongoing things. So it's really cool when you're giving it your data in a like fashion your compliance team is comfortable with. Right. I, I would argue this is a, a heyday for brand guides and I don't know what you would even call it, like a copy guide, essentially, for yeah. like, this is how we talk about this subject. We don't use this terminology. We say this instead of this. Our customers talk this way. Like, all of that information, yes, it's valuable for onboarding, it's valuable for media, it's valuable for external stakeholders, all of that matters. But you're able to then repurpose that for AI in a way that's really powerful. Um, so having those in place, if there was a time and you're worried about that investment of, oh, do we want to revisit the brand guide or do we want to have a copy guide? Now it is more valuable than ever. Absolutely. And it makes it more easy for people to access that information and really make sure that they're getting it right without having to go to that single source of truth. Subject matter experts are so important, but they're going to be able to do more in their day to day if they're not answering some of those nuanced questions time after time. Mm -hmm. I know we have clients like we can't use a certain list of words, so it would be a great 
opportunity to put it into a, an AI tool and then say, hey, make sure I'm not using these 10 words in this long form copy that I just wrote. So I think that's a really easy and simple way to use it too. For sure. It can also give you really simple keyword counts. How many times has this keyword been used in this mm -hmm. article? Like the strategy review process, it is intricate, but it is a pretty, we check for the same things every time. Mm -hmm. Okay, what are those no-go lists for that specific client? How many times have we used each keyword? Is each keyword in a heading tag? All of those things that we just do with our eyes, we mm -hmm. can help leverage AI to streamline some of that process then we can utilize that time to make sure it's as SEO friendly as possible. Maybe we can write more advanced scheming after something like that. And there's so many more things we can do strategically to push those initiatives along. Mm -hmm. And I know some people like they don't have the capacity to do that. And that's what we're here for. But that's also like a good way, as you're just saying, to use that tool is like if you don't have that extra set of eyes, it's just a great tool to use for that. For sure. From AI in headlines, descriptions, email, paid ads, we've covered so much so far. If there's anything we can do to help support you with this as you move through your day-to-day -day marketing activities, don't hesitate to reach out. The Blue Compass team is here to partner with you and be an extension of your team. All right, we're moving on to number four. Let's do a deep dive for the nerds like us who love Performance Max, love Google Ads, and really like the AI that's in that platform. Danny, can you start with how we test headlines and descriptions with Google Ads? Yeah, so kind of like what we talked about, you need 15 up to 15 headlines for descriptions. With Performance Max, you also have longer descriptions. So let's say you write all of your headlines descriptions for your campaigns. It's been a couple of weeks. You notice that your ad has like a good or an average strength. If you go into the Google Ads tool, Performance Max will give you, if you start typing, it'll give you some additional options based on the keywords that you're targeting, based on what's performed well already. Um, it'll just give you some other options. And so that's a really great AI tool to use. Again, if you're kind of like running into a roadblock from a creativity standpoint, you just want to think of like, what are some other ways I can say this? What are some other action verbs I can use? Um, that's just a really great way to utilize what's already in there in, in the Google Ads tool to, to help you enhance what you're already doing. And again, making sure that it's still aligning with your tone, with your brand, ensuring that it's still like the message that you want to give. But again, it's just like a something that's readily available to everybody that you can use to enhance your ads so that you're making sure you're getting the best ROI and the bang for your buck. Sometimes it recommends headlines or descriptions that also have a slightly different sentiment than what we're looking for. And that's usually an indication Google thinks for them, there's money to be made there. Mm -hmm. But if it's a topic we haven't considered for that ad group, it also gives us an opportunity to say, oh, we haven't thought about that. Let's add that in. Let's get some more headlines and descriptions about that. Let's add some keywords. Mm -hmm. So it's a cool way to brainstorm other ideas from a content and keyword perspective, too. Yeah. And the nice thing about doing it in the platform with Google Ads is it does know how long your headlines and descriptions have to be. So you don't have to worry about using an outside tool that might like write something too long and then it no longer fits. So Again, I just it, to have it right there in the platform and for it to be created for that specifically is really helpful. Absolutely. To piggyback on what Katrina was talking about, like sometimes those headlines and descriptions are there because there's money to be made and, and Google wants to expand the keywords you can show up for. But also Google's optimizing for clicks, pay-per-click in most situations. So that means they're recommending it because it's worked somewhere before. They believe that it will work. So there's a lot of value in taking that and at least using part of it and then maybe tweaking it slightly to make it work for your tone or whatever, however you say that, mm -hmm. um, or however you say that as a brand. So it's really cool to have that in platform. I also think there are some ways outside of the platform to also optimize these, like doing a scan of the that web page and saying, based on these keywords that we're targeting, how many of them do we need to add into the page? Do we have them all included um, for this Google Ads campaign? So there's it's another way where I think you can get more feedback because uh, mm -hmm. that's one of the biggest, like I would say, kind of gray areas when you're looking at Google Ads is that landing page score. We have no idea what goes into that. It doesn't give you feedback on it. Oh, it'd be really great if you had this targeted keyword in there mm -hmm. or you have some negative keywords included on this page that's confusing to us. It doesn't give you that feedback. Mm -hmm. And so by leveraging an outside source for that can be helpful to, to kind of layer in and know what should we be focusing on with our headlines and descriptions. Absolutely. And giving it that content and how could how would you optimize this page for this keyword 
seeing what changes it makes. Maybe that gives you more ideas for headlines, too, based on how it's changing a true headline in the copy. Mm -hmm. Our fifth question for today. Jay, can you talk to us about how you leverage AI in video assets within PMAX and maybe within other platforms as well? I'm going to start with what not to leverage with video within PMAX. <laughs> Perfect. Do not use the auto-generated PMAX videos. Uh, Google's going to flag this and take it down and be like, they're saying bad things about Google. <laughs> but it's... <laughs> They, it, you need to turn auto-generated videos off, and the only way to do that is by uploading your own video. So even if it's something really simple, having a video related to your ad campaign and uploading it, 15 to 30 seconds, it doesn't have to be crazy or overproduced. Um, we're seeing that with video in general, is that it doesn't have to be that same production value that it used to be. Um, but getting something in there is better than what you're going to get from this auto-generated one. It just takes your images and your headlines and then creates basically a slideshow PowerPoint presentation and it's it's bad. It feels Real really bad. 90s. Yeah. Um, authentic content's the thing right now, but this is not authentic or quality or anything. It checks none of the boxes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so don't do that. Get something uploaded. Now, as it relates to what to upload, again, it doesn't have to be overproduced. That I think that's the biggest hurdle with video. People think of it as like, this needs to be a commercial, which in some cases, yes, you need to present that high premium experience if that's the type of brand that you have or if that's the need or expectation of the audience. But as it relates to, to video on these platforms, I think just a 15 to 30 second video that really highlights what differenti differentiates you as a brand uh, and how does that connect with your headlines and descriptions. I think that's the way to go. Absolutely. And there's some video platforms that you can use that you can upload a full video. It can cut it into smaller pieces to give you a variety of those 15 to 30 second clips. And this doesn't have to be something that you need a full editing team for, full production. There's a lot of those options out there. Mm -hmm. I'd also say in optimizing Performance Max lately, I've noticed that it really wants you to use videos. So it is an important aspect to make sure you're including in your campaigns to get an excellent score. So it's definitely something that you should be leveraging and using. But to your point, if you can just, you know, record a simple 15, 30 second video related to what you're advertising, a little can go a long way. Absolutely. Katrina made a really good point about being able to cut up videos too, I think. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we think of videos as like individuals, individual formats of video. So you're mm -hmm. recording a 30 second video and this is specifically what it's going to be for. There's a time and a place for that. But often you can record a 30, 45 minute video like podcasts. This is what often what they do where they have a 45 minute, sometimes four hour conversation, and then they split it up into these little chunks where there's the most engagement. And that's where these AI platforms can really mm -hmm. come in handy. We leverage some of them for cutting up videos. Um, and there are some really prominent ones out there. They do a great job of just finding those key points of engagement or insights and then breaking them into smaller sections that you can then use in your ad campaigns. Mm -hmm. With YouTube being such a predominant predominant search engine these days, it's almost impossible, like you said, to get a good score in your PMAX ads without uploading video assets. So mm -hmm. this is all really good as you leverage new PMAX initiatives with your team. I haven't seen the official numbers yet, but I know when we started using the image asset, which was new as of like 12 months ago, yeah. um, we immediately saw like a two to three percentage point increase in click through rate just by using image assets so oh, huge which is massive so and we know video is even more engaging than images so just imagine how much better your campaigns could be if you have that type of an engageable medium leveraged within your campaign. question number six Danny, how are we leveraging AI in our paid ad targeting specifically on LinkedIn I will say this is my favorite one we're covering today yes. So LinkedIn now utilizes predictive audiences. LinkedIn has an algorithm where they're collecting data of how their users, users are interacting on LinkedIn. Who are they interacting with? What companies are they interacting with? What groups are they in? What are they liking? And so LinkedIn's gathering all of this data. And then when you run an ad campaign within LinkedIn, you set up your targeting. And if you choose to use predictive audiences, LinkedIn is strategically deciding who is going to see your ads based on the targeting that you chose, as well as the information that they've gathered. So it's kind of like marrying two things together to say, OK, let's show Joe your ad because he's most likely to engage with it based on what he's done in the past and based on him being in the 
geographical area that you're targeting. He has a job title that you that you're interested in. And so it's a really smart way to get in front of other people. It depends on what you're running in terms of do you want to use predictive audiences? If you're running a really low funnel campaign where you're targeting a very specific person, predictive audience might not be the best choice. But if you are running a top of funnel campaign, kind of like what we we're just talking about with Performance Max, if you want to get in front of more people, you want to get more awareness, predictive audiences would be a really great way to get in front of more people who, again, are more likely to interact and click on your ad. Yeah, it feels like one of the simplest implementations of AI. And it and it's something that you have access to. It's latent data that you you always have if you have a CRM. Uh, the real challenge is just getting that list narrowed down to what who you actually want to go after or people that have the characteristics you want to go after, mm -hmm. but then having the list also be long enough that you can leverage predictive AI because there is a cutoff point um, for a number of users that have a LinkedIn profile that matches. Yep, and I believe that number's 300. 300. Mm -hmm. And so we always recommend uploading if we can get at least 500 because you never know what email address. So for example, how can that get messed up? If Jay is on LinkedIn, but he has his Gmail connected to his LinkedIn, not his work email, and you have his work email on your email list because that's what you require for your CRM, that wouldn't be a match in the system. So that wouldn't count as one of your 300. So it's really important to be able to upload more than 300 when you're trying to leverage predictive audiences. Definitely. And of course, if you have more than 300, that will also help LinkedIn to better target people that are similar. So I would say the bigger the list, the better, but definitely you need at least 300 in order to even utilize predictive audiences. Absolutely. Yeah. The cool thing about it is kind of what we were talking about with email, where mm -hmm. it's a for, I mean, you're uploading this list and then LinkedIn is dynamically building this out and, mm -hmm. and finding more people to fit into that group. Whereas with email, we're like, you have to upload it and then ask for, for more trends data, and then you have to take action on that. Um, this is feels like a really easy win for anybody that's leveraging LinkedIn, especially if you're in like the B2B space. Mm -hmm. For sure. And we've seen great results, like LinkedIn targeting is where it's at right now. Meta's got some catching up to do from our yeah. perspective, <laughs> because between predictive audiences, being able to target people who have previously seen your ad but not clicked on it, being able to target people who have previously clicked on your ad and then having traditional remarketing via pixels on top of that. Like mm -hmm. you have so many layers that you can dive into to make sure you're getting in front of the right people and you're increasing your click through rates, conversions. You have the right number of views per person. It's really cool what you can do in the platform right now. Mm -hmm. And back to kind of what you're we talking about, if you don't have an email list or a big list that you can upload, what you just touched on, if you can start running ads, build up people who have seen your ads but not clicked or people who have clicked your ads, then you can use that information to build the predictive audiences too. So if you don't have a list to start with, you can still run ads, grab, gather that data, and then use predictive audiences at a later date. I would take what we talked about with Pmax and search and apply that here too. Because a lot of people go into LinkedIn ads and are like, why wouldn't I optimize for conversions? Like <laughs> this is, that's what everybody wants is more sales or more leads. Um, but also that totally disputes or like puts aside the larger part of the funnel, which is your awareness and consideration sections, mm -hmm. which is really where I feel like LinkedIn thrives a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, so by having a campaign that's focused on that and then leveraging a Pmax campaign or a search campaign to hit that lower funnel traffic, mm -hmm. you're going to see better performance with a more well-rounded approach like that. Mm -hmm. So just kind of bringing that full circle. Don't just think about them as these individual platforms. It's part of a larger strategy that you're working together and what places are you weakest at? And it's it sounds weird, but it's probably not conversions in most situations. Absolutely. The conversions is a result of having not the quality of traffic and the awareness and consideration portion of the funnel most times. For sure. It's also important to take that final step that we haven't talked about yet. Exclude people who have already converted. You do not want to keep spending ad dollars, keep spending money when they've already bought or filled out the form or whatever it is that you're set, like selling through this ad mm -hmm. and you have to take them out of that audience. There's always ways to target them. There's cross sell opportunities. There's so much of that, but we have to make sure we're not hitting people with the same message after they've done and taken the action we want because that doesn't help our ROI at all. All right. Jay, can you give us two examples of how we leverage in-platform AI to increase conversions for our paid marketing? Yeah, there are two main areas I would talk about with this. One of them with Google Ads is the Keyword and Performance Planner. Um, these are two relatively under-leveraged tools that have 
massive AI functionality within them that are really valuable. The keyword tool is really good for generating ideas and seeing the actual search volume for them. So if you're running a search campaign, leverage the keyword tool. But AI isn't as big of an aspect of it. It's mostly just used to brainstorm. Uh, and you're talking specifically about the Google Ads keyword planner, not correct. other keyword tools. Correct. Yeah. Separate from your SEMrushes and SE rankings of the world. Uh, this is within the Google Ads platform, totally free. Um, if you have a Google Ads account, you have access to it. Same thing with Performance Planner. Performance Planner, what it does is it allows you to pull in all of your campaigns and say, if I increase my budget by $500, and I'm optimizing for conversions, then what would be the best budget breakout to deliver on conversions or deliver more conversions? Or what should my budget ideally be in each of my campaigns? And so I've not heard a lot about this, that people are leveraging this, but as we have, it has had a drastic impact on delivery for clients. And you can switch that based on the funnel or what you're trying to address with those campaigns. So you can include all of your low funnel campaigns and optimize for conversions, or you can include your higher funnel display campaigns based on clicks. You can really swap it around based on what the actual need is. So that is a tool I would recommend leveraging. Again, it's within the tools within Google ads um, and AI that's using AI and predictive models to build that recommendation. So it's a really, really cool tool. Uh, and then the second part of this, I would say is on the conversions aspect. So you're talking, we're talking super low funnel. We're talking about people, um, that are in the market today to buy our services. What we've found with clients is that not all conversions are created equally and that they value them in different ways. And the reality is with Google ads specifically and with other platforms too, we can let the platform know what that weighting is via what's called conversion value. So we can go into our conversion goals within Google ads and say, whether it's on a one to 100 scale or a one to 10 scale, or if you have actual revenue and pass that data into the platform. So that as it's optimizing, it's looking and saying, okay, they value conversions that are form fills as a 10, but phone calls are a one. So if I'm trying to get the most conversion value, let's focus on who's more likely to fill out a form rather than to call the business. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a valuable hack, especially if you have that data from a CRM or from a client relationship standpoint. Absolutely. And even if you don't know the exact ROI of the average form fill, but you know you have a higher conversion rate off of form submissions than you do off of phone calls, putting those numbers in there, even if it's arbitrary, gives Google something to latch on to and really optimize off of. We see so many clients get hung up on, well, I don't know that official number. I want to hold off. We got to start moving with what do we know, what do we have in front of us, and then how can we leverage that, especially if we see somebody who's utilizing a more entry level campaign method. If you're using an AdWords Express or something like that, those conversion values are absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. They could be optimizing off of a page view, which your page view is in no relation as strong of a conversion point as a phone call, which is also not as valuable as a form fill. So there's this whole domino effect. And when we start leveraging those components, we're able to see really good increases in the specific type of conversion that we like. We don't always see a full increase in the number of conversions we normally do. But if we can get 10 form submissions instead of 15 phone calls and that's more valuable to us, we're definitely moving in the right direction. We're optimizing off of the activity that we need to see on site on a weekly monthly basis. And it's one of those things where something's better than nothing. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like we have clients who uh, either they're an e-commerce site and so we actually get revenue data in there. I mean, Beautiful. you can get return on ad spend. It's awesome. That's not the reality for most clients. Yep. For most clients, just throwing in a one to 10 scale and asking them, here are all of your conversions. How would you rate this from a value standpoint on a one to 10 scale? We will implement that data and then we'll revisit it in three months and see what happens. It's it's It will have a positive impact regardless because you're going to be getting more of what the, what you actually value when you do that. And doing this in the Google Ads platform, it's so easy to change. So we have a seasonal client who, when it is peak season, all they want is phone calls. They do not have time to be looking through the form submissions. Phone calls are their bread and butter. But in off season, the form submissions are actually more valuable. We can rotate those on a weekly, monthly basis if necessary to make sure we're hitting that right conversion value for that season even. 
Yeah, and, and the scale can be adjusted. Like we're talking on a one to 10 scale, but then as you get more sophisticated or as you have, have more data or you have a peak season and now form fills are no longer a 10, they're a five, and then phone calls are now a 20 or a 50 or so. It, it, it's arbitrary, essentially. It's whatever level of granularity you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, ROI calculations can be complicated. Some of this can be really overwhelming if you're not used to using GTM, Google Ads, the conversion planner. There's so many components of this. Do not hesitate to reach out to Blue Compass. We are here to partner with you and make your job easier day to day. Last question that we have today. Danny, how are we leveraging customer calls and communication from customers to enhance our marketing effort? Nowadays, there are tools that can transcribe phone calls between you and your customers, and as well as on like Zoom meetings, or if you use Microsoft Teams, you can use tools within the platform, or you can purchase a tool that will basically transcribe your whole conversation, and then it will basically create bullet points of like, here are the main things that you guys talked about. And that can be really helpful in terms of how can you, if you're seeing themes throughout phone calls with your clients, or if you're noticing like the same questions coming up, how can you better educate in your marketing campaigns to ensure that new customers who come in to your funnel or have, you know, prospect calls, you can use that information to better educate them. And so we have a client who uses CallRail. It's been really helpful in terms of, okay, here is what we're noticing when people are on the phone with people who are prospects that are calling in. They're often asking this question or we're noticing, you know, X percentage of calls are going to voicemail. And so it's a really great way to utilize that information to better enhance both marketing, but also sales. So like, how can we just be better stewards of conversations with our customers to then enhance what we're doing in our other marketing efforts? Because marketing these days can be expensive. And so just being able to have better messaging is gonna be a better use of your, your dollars to make sure that you are getting the best bang for your buck. We can also see transitions that are happening in those specific markets by hearing our clients starting to talk about things a little different when they're asking for something and they don't know the exact product or service title. Mm -hmm. What words are they using? That can inform our keyword planning. That can inform our what headlines and descriptions we need. There's so many components that we can use from that. Mm -hmm. And it's really cool to see how we're able to leverage those insights into other marketing efforts too. Mm -hmm. Totally. There's so much gold there that AI can mine at scale that we would have to listen to all of those phone calls or read the transcriptions to really get there and i think it's on the positive and the negative side yep. so uh, oftentimes early in a campaign we don't fully understand what customers value mm -hmm. um the client understands or or you as a business maybe understand what you think your differentiator is but that may or may not resonate with your audience but via those calls, you will get a deeper understanding of what is it that they really like? What is it they care about? Even if it's a prospect, they're going to say, I heard that you have X, Y, Z feature and I need that tomorrow. If that's not on your list and you're not hearing that and adjusting your messaging accordingly, you're missing out on a whole opportunity there. And then I would also say on the negative side, especially on the customer support call side of things, you can start to see what are the pain points we need to address or is there a pain point that's simply a misunderstanding that we can cover with messaging or with um, the way we talk about our products or services. And I think that's that all kind of gets managed at scale when you leverage AI as a part of your process. Before we wrap up the webinar today, I'd like to give some tangible examples of how else can we be leveraging AI? How can we be using a chat GPT, a closed loop, AI tool, anything like that. And I know we each use it in different ways. So hoping to talk about that a little bit. I will go first. So one example of how we've started to use it, we talked a little bit earlier about uploading brand guides, uploading internal materials to a closed AI system. You can leverage that in so many ways. Multiple of our internal team members have started doing this. They're really curating really purposeful conversations that the whole team can then access. So for example, one thing that we can do what are best practices? We are constantly asking each other, what size does this image need to be? And it changes all the time. It's so crazy. Each platform has their own set of specs, but if we're all uploading that to a single thread, we know what the most recent one is. We're giving it a timestamp. We can ask ChatGPT instead of having to send a message to the entire digital marketing team and get some of these answers back day to day. Other ways that we can leverage this, we can upload internal sales materials. We can upload maybe a statement of work, things like that. And then we can troubleshoot questions that are going to come up from that. 
So let's say we know customers are having a hard time accessing a certain system. We can ask, how would you answer this? And we can start to get FAQs back really easily that tie into our specific content, our specific softwares, our systems. And then we don't need to spend the time writing out all of these FAQs for internal, whether it's a knowledge center, help guides, things like that. So those are two ways that I've seen us start to use this, that we're really saving internal manpower from those components. Jay, do you have an example for us? I think I would piggyback a little bit on what we were talking about with call rail and with FAQs. I think FAQs is one of the most under leveraged aspects of your website because it has a lot of SEO value. It's likely if somebody's looking up for looking up a brand and term for your business, it's usually one of two things is like they already know they're going to work with you. So they're putting that in so they can call you or they have a question. And so by having your FAQs pre-built and having those things just right out and ready and available, whether they get to the site or whether they're just seeing a people also ask or an FAQ drop down from search, it's so valuable. So I would say, how do you fit AI into that? The way we talked about before, if you have a support email address, if you have a phone number that has tracking, like that is such a, a valuable way to integrate it, that it's going to have a direct impact on your business. You're going to have less. Uh, less time spent on the phone answering the same questions you answer a million times and you're going to give a more consistent answer because you've given one answer to the question rather than whoever picks up the phone and is answering that day and may or may not know the correct answer to the question. So it uh, feels a bit like a cheat to what you said, but that's, I think, the easiest way to implement it and have a strong impact in the short term. We've had multiple clients tell us our sales team doesn't have to answer questions when they're showing up. That is my favorite testament to quality content marketing, quality SEO. We've made everything available. We make sure that the public or whoever's coming to the site knows exactly what they need to know about that topic. Mm -hmm. And then the sales team is still so valuable and important. They're getting some of those differentiators in. But if there's not additional questions they have to answer and we can save them time, we've really done our job. Mm -hmm. Danny, do you have an example you want to share with us? Yes, I feel like the way I'd utilize it most is kind of what we talked about. It's just enhancing copy that we've already written. So a lot of my time is spent strategy reviewing content. And sometimes I'll know what I want to get out of it, but I don't necessarily know the best way to get there. And so using a tool, an AI tool like ChatGPT, saying like, hey, can you help me make this headline stronger or make it less salesy? That's a really great way to utilize it. Again, it's not always coming up with the final answer, but it's uh, just another like creative brain, if you will, in terms of how else can I get to the end result that I want to see. And so definitely from a content perspective is how I've utilized it most. Absolutely. I love the application because it takes your bias out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I know early on when I first started, Katrina and I, we, we talked about this so many times, like don't put your preference into the way that you're reviewing things. And it's so hard to do because it's so ingrained to you. Like, oh, I don't like that word or like this word choice seems funky to me. Mm -hmm. By you can keep that sentiment and be like, something seems off about this headline. I think it's too serious, whatever it is. Can you reapproach this and, and think about it in a different way? And then it's no longer you dictating to that person how to write it. It's It has a very specific purpose and it's going to, adjust it based on its best practices and understand. Here's another way to think about it, basically. Yeah. One last thought as we move into year end, you know, timeliness of publishing here, we're sitting down, we're already working on 2025 strategies for most of our clients. How are we leveraging AI to help us with goal building, strategy building, tactic differentiation? Do you have any recommendations or thoughts on how we're using that today? I think first and foremost is the performance planner tool for Google ads. If you're running any Google ads campaigns, it's a great time to take a look at that. Whether, especially if you're going to be picking up the same campaigns going into next year, yep. you have a whole year's worth of data that you're operating on. And so it's going to be able to give you a really good recommendation. The, the second thing I would take a look at would be your targeting within those platforms. For what, if you're using LinkedIn, we, we're just going to keep praising LinkedIn today because it's a great example, but it gives you that it gives you feedback on like how much money you're going to spend per day, how much money you're going to spend per click. What's the audience size? What's the recommended budget? So look at all that now, get your targeting lined up and your audiences lined up now. So you don't have to think about it in January when you start up these new mm -hmm. campaigns. Absolutely. 
Go ahead, Danny. Um, I was just going to say on Friday, I actually used it to say, hey, here's a campaign we're running. What job titles are available to me? Because, you know, in LinkedIn, like it's just such a long list you don't always know. And so, again, it's not perfect, but like it's just a way to generate new ideas and you can build that audience in LinkedIn. OK, this audience is 1.4 million people. How much ad budget would I need in order to make sure I'm hitting all of those people in like a decent amount of time? Right. So I think that would be to your point, like how do we use it? for budgeting purposes, building your audiences now to know who you want to target to determine like how much ad spend would you need to budget for. Absolutely. Jay earlier talked about like removing our bias from different things. I really like to use it to say, okay, here's my target audience. I'm feeding into whatever AI platform I'm using. This is exactly who I'm trying to reach. These are exactly what my goals are. So I need to be that thought leader up front. But then I'm also asking what additional tactics should I be considering? Mm -hmm. There's infinite number of things that we could do online. And so really being able to get out of my brain, I have a proclivity to SEO. I really like Google ads, but I don't always think as much about social. I don't think about email as much. How can that help make us more well-rounded individuals and make sure we don't have a blind spot in our strategies too? I love that. That in there's, a, I have a kind of a systematized way. Unsurprisingly, uh, <laughs> the way I think about strategies, so I'll list out all the problems that the, the clients having or that they need to resolve, what solutions I see for that, and then we break it into KPIs and tactics and things. That's another thing that you can feed the platform. Like, how much data or information can you give? All right, the client has all of these problems that they need to address with their marketing strategy. Here are the solutions I'm thinking about. And here are the tactics I'm thinking about using. Does that seem to match or is there anything missing? So I think it goes with what you're saying, but how much more context can you give to round out that strategy more? And that's what we've seen throughout this whole experience. The more context we're able to give, the more direction we're able to give, the better prompts we're able to do, and then continue relying on those. It takes forever to curate that. You know, not trying to be dramatic, but it takes a long time to get all of that information in there and make it work for you the way you need. So make sure you're going back to those conversations, going back to those threads, whatever's applicable as you continue to use it. So you're not starting from scratch every time. All right. So that's what we have for you today. Thank you so much for joining us for eight ways you can integrate AI into your day to day marketing efforts. And again, please don't hesitate to reach out to Blue Compass if there's anything we can do to support you with these things. I mean, we listed eight things, probably a couple more at the end here, and that is not even scratching the surface of everything that AI can do for you today. Don't hesitate to reach out as you build your 2025 strategy if Blue Compass can support you.